Good morning. You see, they found the knob again. They found it last week. It was in the room in there. I didn't know it was blue. See, that's blue? I didn't know it was blue. I thought it was the same color as the rest of it. Looking all over for something gray. <coughs> Revelation chapter 20. We're almost done with this series, and we're going to start with Revelation chapter 3 where we left off some time ago. I seen this little thing on here. I don't know if my brother added it, maybe shared it or something. I can see him saying this. He's a year and nine months older than I am. He's about uh, four inches taller than I am. And he used to be a little bit rounder than I am. (laughs) But I, I think I'm catching him there. Anyway, he said, I promised myself I'd lose 40 pounds this year. Only 50 more to go. Ain't that the way? I'm so thankful for the uh, opportunity to come together in church and to uh, fellowship with you and to uh, enjoy that fellowship, friendship. Brothers and sisters in Christ. And the opportunity to sing songs to the Lord and worship Him through that means. I uh, especially like this last song and the words that we sang and believe scripturally that we're saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. It's through Jesus Christ's righteousness that we can stand before God. In the end, I say that because uh, I don't remember when it was a while back. I found some literature that had been left here in the church. I don't think it was left by anybody here, but uh, with the school and everything else going on, it was left here. And it talked about how to be born again. I thought, well, that's pretty good, maybe. But I read through. I always check the literature that's left here. And it said how to be born again. You must be baptized, water baptism. Now, I don't know where you stand on baptism. I believe it's necessary. I believe it's important that every believer should be baptized. It's our identification with Jesus Christ, our testimony. But we're saved through faith in Christ by the grace of God, not through any other means, any other works. It's all from God. Nothing we do except believe. Anyway, I just enjoyed that song and appreciated it. Let's pray. Lord God, I thank you for the opportunity again of meeting together with your your people, Jesus, the church, the body of Christ. Meeting together to worship you collectively, to offer up our praise and honor and adoration to you to fellowship with one another, just as you told us, Jesus, a new commandment I give you, that you love one another as I have loved you. And by this, all men will know that you are my followers, my disciples, if you have love one for another. Lord God, we need to love one another, love one another in Christ. I pray that you will be blessed by our worship and our adoration of you this morning. And I pray that as we look into your word again, the, your word, God, the word of God, that you will teach us by your spirit. 
just in our minds, but in our hearts. We're dealing with a very, very grave subject. Though we as believers, Lord, know of our destination, we all know people who do not. And they are bound for a Christless eternity. I pray, Lord God, that you'll speak to our hearts, make us to realize how serious it is, and maybe create opportunities to reach out to others with a gospel. I pray that you'll bless your word this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. I read this interesting article uh, three or four weeks ago. It was the uh, true article of a broadcast that was aired over the radio waves in 1938. It was broadcast over the radio station WMCA out of New York City. The conductor, if you want to call him that, of this uh, broadcast was Erling Olsen. And for his guest, he had a professor from New York University. His name was C.T. Schwartzy, Carl Theodore Schwartzy. I've had some of his books in my library before. He's an avid believer, of course, but he was a professor of physics, of science, and of astronomy at New York University. He wrote many books. One of the books I used to have is called Harmony of Science and the Bible. This particular broadcast was on a thesis that he had written. It went into a book form later. And it became so, not controversial, but uh, eye-opening and popular to so many that they had this broadcast on the radio waves back in 1938. The subject, or the title, was The Bible and Science... On the Everlasting Fire. The Bible and Science on the Everlasting Fire. I'm going to just read it. It's a little bit lengthy, but please listen. Very interesting. Going across the radio waves. C.T. Schwartzy. He said, the word lake must connote a body of matter having liquid form. And we call it the lake of fire, remember? Therefore, he says, if scripture is true, this eternal fire must be in liquid form. Now, whether your translations say the lake of fire or the lake of burning sulfur, he said it needs to be liquid. If the Bible is true and we take it literally... The eternal fire must be in liquid form. So listen to what he says. He's a scientist, he's an astronomer, he's a physics teacher in physiology. The very simple proof of the portions of Scripture that we have been discussing lies in the existence of the singular phenomena of the skies known as midget or white dwarf stars. You can check them out. It's very interesting. He says a white dwarf star or midget star is one which, because of things that have happened to it, should be roughly 5,000 or more times as big as it really is. Applying this idea for illustration to such a planet as the Earth, you would conceive that the Earth has Uh, having shrunk to such an extent that its diameter would be only 400 miles rather than the 8,000 miles in diameter that it really is. 
This enormous density, this compacting, this shrinking down, the density, has a great deal to do with our subject, he says. Illustration, he says, most people know the sun, our nearest star, is rather hot, to say the least. There is general agreement in the dwarf stars that the temperature at or near the center of stars is between, listen, 25 million to 30 million degrees Fahrenheit. Would you say that's warm? At such temperatures, much can happen like the bursting of atoms, which helps to explain the phenomenon of the white dwarf. He goes on to explain. At a temperature of three or 30 million degrees Fahrenheit, it will explode atoms. It would cause the atoms to lose their electrons, even though the attraction between nucleus and electrons is an octillion times the attraction of gravity. The separated parts could then be better packed in, particularly under such great pressure. With the constant activity of x-rays, atom walls could not be reformed. Therefore, enormous densities, such as are found in the dwarf planets, can be attained. Now please note, he says, at such high temperatures, all matter would be in the form of gas. In a white dwarf, the pressure is so great that gases become compressed to the consistency of a liquid. Before such a star could ever cool off and gradually become a dark star, I guess you'd call it, it would have to expand to normal proportions that is, it would have to get to be more than 5,000 times its present size. Here's the difficulty. Such expansion would cause enormous heat, which in turn would absolutely keep the star compressed. In other words, it could never happen. Insofar as astronomers and physicists know, the midget stars can never cool off. The white dwarf stars, to all intents, can never, ever burn out. Then he summarizes it this way. May I summarize to show you the Bible, God's word is scientifically accurate. We find first an eternal fire which cannot burn out. Secondly, we see the consistency of liquid, a lake of fire. Third place, he says, it cannot be quenched, for any quenching material such as water would immediately have its atoms stripped of electrons and be packed in were the rest in the density. And in the fourth place, ever since astronomers have been and still are studying this strange phenomenon, it is only too evident that the lake of fire has been prepared and is now ready. He said, although we cannot say that God will actually use these lakes of fire in fulfilling his word, the answer to the skeptic or the unbeliever on this subject is that in the heavens there are already 
lakes of fire. That was so amazing, so interesting. The physicists, astronomers, and scientists have been studying these dwarf stars for centuries and found all of what he has said to be true. Lakes of fire existing already in the heavens. We had stated in our study about this, the second point that we were looking at, and that was this. Hell, or the lake of fire, was prepared for the devil and his angels. Past tense. Actually, I mentioned last week, perfect tense in the Greek language. Remember I said English had three tenses, Greek has seven tenses. And the perfect tense speaks of something that is past with present results, ongoing present results. So the literal Greek reads, having been prepared, having been prepared for the devil and the angels of him. And I shared with you Kenneth Weath's extended translation, which has been prepared and is in readiness for the devil and his angels, prepared ahead of time. We looked at uh, Isaiah 30, and I mentioned at the conclusion last week that no being, human or spirit, is in presently this place, the lake of fire. Hell, referred to in imagery from Jesus in the scriptures as Gehenna. No one's there. Certainly not the devil, because we're reading in chapter 20, it says in verse 10 of chapter 20, that the devil who deceived the people was thrown into the lake of burning sulfur, or the lake of fire, where the beast and false prophet had been thrown. And they'll be tormented day and night forever and ever. They're not there yet. This concept and this idea that you find in the world and their, their thoughts and their understanding of hell is that the devil is already coming and going from there. I mean, you talk to me, the devil's in hell and he comes back out to do his business and stuff. No, he's not. No devil. No angels. No human spirit or soul of a person yet is in this place. Not yet. One verse, and then we'll move to the next point. Second Peter chapter 2. I want to look at that because that was so interesting to me. Second Peter chapter 2, where Peter is giving illustrations of the certainty of God's judgment that is coming. And he uses various illustrations or examples. And notice what he says. I'm going to start He's referring to these false teachers whose condemnation has long been hanging over them and their destruction has not been sleeping. Verse 4, For if God did not spare angels when they sinned, but sent them to Tartarus, not hell, this place, but to Tartarus, the lowest, deepest, darkest part of Hades, putting them into glooming dungeons to be held for or until the final judgment. And if he did not spare the ancient world when he brought the flood on its ungodly people, but protected Noah, preacher of righteousness, and seven others. And third illustration, if he condemned the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah by burning them to ashes and made them an example of what is going to happen to the ungodly. And if he rescued Lot, a righteous man who was distressed by the filthy lies of lawless men, for that righteous man living among them day after day was tormented in his righteous soul by the lawless deeds he saw and heard. Now as he concludes 
what he has said here with these three illustrations. He said, if this be so, then the Lord knows how to not only rescue godly men from trials, but also to hold the unrighteous, hold the unrighteous for the day of judgment. while continuing their punishment. I like to add in Hades. Holding them. Is that chart, Ben? Please. Oh. We've seen this multiple times, but I did such a good job on it. Actually, Stuart put it in color and put it all in there. I gave him a rough draft. Here we go. Bodies of believers in the grave. Bodies of believers, unbelievers in the grave. Where's their spirit? Where's their soul? Hades. Unbelievers in Hades. Souls and spirits of believers, resurrection, you know, they're with a, in paradise with, with the Lord. The rapture will occur, and we'll talk about that when we get back into Revelation again. But the unbelievers in Hades, they're being held until final judgment occurs. Final judgment will occur. There will be a second resurrection. Remember we talked about that in Revelation 20? Remember what he said there about all those people that were were resurrected and, and they reigned with Christ for a thousand years. Verse 4, he says, And I saw thrones on which were seated those who had been given authority to judge, and I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded because of their testimony for Jesus and because of the word of God. They had not worshipped the beast or his image and not received his mark on their foreheads or in their hands. And they came to life and reigned. They were resurrected with Christ a thousand years. Then he puts this note in there. This, the rest of the dead did not come to life until the thousand years were ended. Those in Hades, the unbelievers, they were not resurrected until the thousand years was ended. And then they are resurrected. Revelation 20, 11 through the end of the chapter for judgment. For judgment. Okay, thanks. So, just to let you know, it's there already. Whether it's those planets in the universe somewhere, or whether it's down below, or whether it's something God has made separately, I don't know. It's just interesting. And those who have died without Christ are in Hades, their spirit, waiting for the final judgment, which will happen after the kingdom. So then we just introduce this idea. I like what Daniel said about those who have no hope in Christ. No hope. Hell is eternal. There is no getting out. Hell is eternal. Now, I want to believe that all of us know Christ. All of us know we're saved. Thank God. Praise the Lord. Jesus saved us. But you all know people who aren't. How can we not have compassion? The Bible says more than once that God is not willing that anyone should perish, but that all should come to repentance. He's doing all that he can right now. The gospel's going all over the world. And people are spreading that gospel and they're telling people to turn to God, to trust Jesus, the one who died for their place, in their place, the one who rose again for their justification. To believe in him, trust him. Because hell is eternal. And God's love for the world that has been demonstrated 
but God is also just. And the time will come when those opportunities will be gone. Hell is eternal. Webster's Encyclopedia Dictionary. I don't know why I want to be crooked all the time. Defines eternal three ways. First of all, without beginning or ending. Pretty simple. Secondly, he said it's always existing. And thirdly, he defined it as lasting forever. Lasting forever. Now, the Greek language is a little bit more precise in that it brings out different ideas. A little more precise. Two words in Greek are translated eternal or everlasting. And, and either one of those words can be translated in our Bibles many times one way or the other, eternal or everlasting. Kind of same thing, but not quite. How many of you know, well, you know, I know Pablo does. How many of you know here Spanish? Can you say adios? What does that mean? Goodbye. Well, I guess it would mean goodbye in a way. Adios. That is a Greek word. Do you know that? You speak Spanish? You speak Greek. Adios. Adios. Actually, in Greek, it's adios. The hyphen is somewhere else. Adios. And it speaks of the characteristic of eternality. If that ain't a word, it should be. It means without beginning or end, permanent, unchangeableness. That word is used in like Romans 1.20. About God's eternal power being seen by what is made, you know. God's eternal power is unchanging. Without beginning and end, he's always been there. He's eternal. But there's a second word that is used for our study, and that is aeonios. Can you say aeonios? Aeonios. See, you speak Greek. Aeonios. It speaks of the essence of eternalness, what it is like. What it's like. Endless duration, not limited by time, outside of and beyond time. There is no time. Just endless duration. Those are the words that are used for one in Revelation 20, verse 10. If you look at it again, Revelation 20 and verse 10. The devil who deceived the nations was thrown into the lake of burning sulfur or the lake of fire where the beast and the false prophet had been thrown. Now they were not annihilated. They didn't cease to exist it said they will be tormented day and night, and here's the words, forever and ever. It's a dual, dual words. Aeonios to aeonios. Aeonios to aeonios. It's something like when Jesus would say, truly, truly. Remember reading that in your King James Bible, or verily, verily. He put two of them together. I think it's so emphatic, so important, and so true. So truly, truly, I say unto you, unless a man is born again, he cannot enter the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven. Truly, truly. Aeonios to aeonios, forever and ever. He didn't just say forever, but forever and ever. I want you to understand, he says, this never ends Never. It's forever and ever, outside of time. Pretty serious. Jude says the same thing uh, about the illustrations he's given 
about those in Sodom and how they serve as an example. I'm reading in Jude verse 7. Even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the surrounding towns gave themselves up to sexual immorality and perversion, they serve as an example of those who suffer the punishment of eternal fire. Eoneos puro, eternal fire. I want you to see the imagery in the Old Testament. Isaiah 66, it's the last chapter in Isaiah. Isaiah has been called many times the little Bible, because just like there's 66 books in our Bible, there's 66 chapters in this book here. Many refer to it as the Gospel of Isaiah. He has so many mentions of the, of the Savior. Isaiah 53, among other places. At the end of his book, end of his prophecy, as he's dealing with Israel in particular, the people of God, the nation of Israel, and how that God's going to restore them. He's going to bring them back to their land. He's going to restore them. And, and, uh, and in the end times, all the nations will, will come to them, and they will be prosperous, and they will be blessed, and other nations will come to them to worship their God, to worship God at the temple. And he contrasts. He contrasts the fate of the righteous with the fate of the unrighteous in the last verses. He says in verse 23, As the new heavens and the new earth that I make will endure before me, declares the Lord, so will your name, the Israelites, the Jewish people, and the descendants endure. From one new moon to another, from one Sabbath to another, all mankind will come and bow down before me, says the Lord. And they will go out and look upon the dead bodies of those who rebelled against me. This is imagery. Their worm will not die, nor will their fire be quenched. The imagery of everlasting punishment. Now it was so that Jesus referred to that in Mark chapter 9. Flick there now. Come on, we're a Bible church. We believe the Bible. What does the Bible say? Well, here we go. Mark chapter 9. There's others too, but I'm just looking at Mark chapter 9 because I'm already out of time. And I got one more point. Honest, one more point, but I won't do it today. We'll do it next week. (laughs) And it's very important. Jesus' solemn words, using Isaiah's imagery in Mark chapter 9, also in Matthew, but we're looking at Mark chapter 9, verse 43. Jesus says, and he's talking to his disciples particularly, he says, if your hand caused you to sin, cut it off. It's better for you to enter life maimed than with two hands to go into Gehenna, hell, where the fire never goes out. And if your foot causes you to sin, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life crippled than to have two feet and be thrown into Gehenna, hell. And if your eye causes you to sin, pluck it out. It is better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye than to have two eyes and be thrown into Gehenna, hell. Notice what he says, the imagery. Where their worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. Eternal. As Mindy was saying that Daniel was talking about, no hope of restoration, ever. I can't even fathom that. I try to think about that, and I can't even fathom it. Shortly after we were saved, uh, Audrey and I moved to Grand Rapids, Michigan, where I was to go into Bible college. 
and we began to pray for our parents. I prayed for my parents. She was praying for her parents. I was praying for her parents, too, and she was praying for mine. And our siblings, <laughs> our brothers and sisters, because we had an urgency that people are dying at the rate of nearly 100 every minute. So all the time that we're in here fellowshipping and learning God's word, what, 40,000, 80,000 people die somewhere? Where do they go? I don't know about you, but I've been to a lot of funerals, unfortunately, in this position as pastor and a preacher, teacher of the Word of God. And we used to have a lot of uh, people that died when we were at our retirement church. We were there for 12 years. And the retirement church was in the retired community. It was in a retirement facility. There were uh, nearly 300 people in there, 300 souls. Many of them, most of them, had lost their spouse. A few didn't, but they were there in that retired community. And we founded a church right in there. We would be there every Sunday. And we did other activities with them as well. But we preached the word there, and because of the uh, location and the age of all of these folks, we had memorial services or funerals probably whew, every couple of weeks, it seemed like. Now, many of the folks that we knew, we would have in our church service in the activity room, we'd set up every, every week, almost like we do here, and we had, quite frankly, as I look out here now, we had more folks there than, than, you have, than we have here in church every Sunday. Of course, where else did, could they go? <laughs> but they were there, and we knew a lot of them, and many of them were believers, and some were not. We had Mormons, Roman Catholic, Baptist, Methodist, Lutheran, Episcopalian, well, Bible church people, atheists even. We had a lot of funerals. Many of them were saved people, and what a joy it was to preach the Word of God and give that hope like, like what they were talking about this morning. But there were some that were not. And I'll never, ever forget. I can still see their faces. At the uh, cemetery, I was standing there with my Bible, and there was daughter and daughter and granddaughter and grandson and you know, the whole family there, and there's the, the coffin. They're going to lower, her name was Gail, lower her body down into the, the ground. And they were there. Have you ever seen the faces of someone who has absolutely, totally no hope? None. I did not know what to say. And that's really bad for a preacher. <laughs> I didn't know what to say. What do you say? Oh, you'll see him again when you get to heaven. You can't say that. Because as far as I know, she, she came to church many times, but she never expressed faith in Christ. They certainly didn't know Jesus. How can you bring comfort in a situation like that? How can you bring hope? You can't. I just read some scripture. I read the gospel in hopes that the Spirit of God would open their eyes and ears. Because I know, I know where she went. I know where they will go if they don't turn to God, turn to Christ. 
I pray God gives us a real burden, a real compassion. Because you got family, I got family, people you love. I'm going to tell you, if they have not trusted Jesus Christ, if they do not know Jesus, they are going to hell. That's what God says. That's what the Bible says. I'll give us a burden. Not that we go got to grab somebody and start preaching and cramming it down their throat, but look for those opportunities to share Jesus with folks because time is so short. You all heard about that fatality up the road here yesterday? Horrible. I think those parents, when they come up to get their son, knew anything about that. They just come drive up to get their son because his car went off the, the ditch and stuff and he, the wrecker was there and did they know that was their last moment on earth? Nobody knew. We don't know. We don't know. One thing we do know for sure, we're all going to die unless Christ comes. And so are the people we know and love. We need to speak. The opportunity comes, we need to speak. Because this isn't just something that they're going to go to jail for 50 years and then get out. It's forever. It's forever. Let's pray. Lord God, thank you for your word and how you teach us and how you, Lord God, have compassion. You're not willing that any should perish. You want to save people so they don't go to such a place. Lord God, help us to have that same compassion, that same burden, that same desire. Because it matters. We might serve you in that way. Speak to our hearts, Lord. Looking forward to that moment in time when we hear that trumpet and we will be called up to your presence. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.